guys for watching. Today we want to talk about the next pope, who I am convinced will be the false prophet, the second beast of Revelation 13. I believe that we could be only a few months away from this happening, so I'd like to focus in on a couple of strong possibilities of who this next pope could be. I know that some of you believe that the false prophet will be an evangelical preacher, but Revelation 13 does say that the false prophet will have immense power worldwide, a power equal to that of the Antichrist. That kind of worldwide power is not within the scope of a Christian evangelical preacher who would not be accepted by the vast majority of the world's population. It can, however, be achieved by a pope who unites all religions under him, something that the Vatican has been pushing for for a number of years now. In case you don't know, there is an ongoing attack aimed directly at Pope Francis. This attack is two-pronged, a joint effort by both Trump allies on the one hand and conservative forces within the Catholic Church on the other hand, both with the idea to get Pope Francis to step down or resign. The attack on Francis led by Trump allies was begun not long after Pope Francis publicly criticized Trump a couple of years back. As we all know, Trump is incredibly thin-skinned, likely at a level that no U.S. president has ever been. Trump has bragged that when, when he is attacked, he strikes back ten times harder. The removal of Pope Francis would be the ultimate payback in his eyes. Trump's desire to get back at Pope Francis was originally spearheaded by none other than Steve Bannon before Trump and Bannon parted ways. Bannon, along with others, has actively worked with conservative Catholics in Europe to further the goal of removing Pope Francis. This attack by Trump allies hasn't been framed as coming from Trump, but rather as an effort by Catholic laity, the ordinary members of the Catholic Church, to remove a liberal pope. The second prong of the attack on Francis is by conservative forces within the church who view Francis as having liberalized the church. One powerful figure leading this is Archbishop Bagano. If that name sounds familiar, Bagano is the former Vatican ambassador to Washington, and he published an explosive letter back in 2018 that accused Pope Francis and other high-ranking Vatican officials of covering up for those accused of sexual misconduct in the church. In that letter, Pagano called on Pope Francis to resign. Pagano also sent a letter to Trump and later released it publicly. In that letter, Pagano expressed a belief in the so-called deep state that opposes Trump and in a deep church that opposes reform. In the letter, Pagano lauded Trump and portrayed him as a hero. Trump, of course, loved the flattery and later tweeted about the letter, encouraging everyone to read it. Pagano himself has a bit of a checkered past, having been accused in Europe of embezzling millions of dollars from his own brother. He also allegedly ordered officials of the Archdiocese of St. Paul and Minneapolis to end an investigation to sexual misconduct on the part of Archbishop John Neenstead. Just to be clear, I am not defending Pope Francis by any means. He may or may not have a responsibility for covering up sexual abuse in the church. But to me, it's clear that he will be the fall guy. By removing him, conservatives and moderates in the Catholic Church can claim that they are taking forceful action against someone who has covered up sexual abuse allegations. And they can also claim they are taking strong action to reform the church. Although I believe Bagano to be too old and too controversial to be considered for the next pope, he is exactly the type of individual who seems to want to ingratiate himself back into the inner workings of the Vatican. As far as the new pope himself, I want to focus on the two men that I believe this will come down to. There are other contenders, of course, but these two men are at the top, in my opinion. There is also something very odd about the name of one of these two men, and I'll cover that in just a moment. The first major candidate, in my opinion, is Cardinal Raymond Burke. Cardinal Burke is notoriously pro-Trump and has defended him on numerous occasions. 
even including his immigration policy. Burke has openly criticized Pope Francis and likened the church under Francis' leadership to a ship without a rudder. While there is a lot of support for a conservative like Burke to be the next pope, especially among those who want to see major reform in the church, Burke does run into one problem. It's the College of Cardinals that chooses the next pope, and Pope Francis has basically remade the College of Cardinals in his own image. As of now, well over 50% of the cardinals who will select the next pope have been chosen by Pope Francis. This greatly increases the likelihood that Pope Francis' successor will continue on the same path as his papacy. Although Cardinal Burke is a leading contender to be the next pope, I do think that choosing an American cardinal who has been so overtly critical of Pope Francis would be a bridge too far for many of these cardinals since they still likely view Pope Francis fondly. The second and more likely candidate, in my opinion, is Cardinal Pietro Parolin. Parolin has been the Vatican Secretary of State <coughs> since 2013 and is second in Vatican hierarchy after the Pope. He has often been talked about in the past as being one of the names considered for being the next pontiff. Many conservatives in Catholic laity view Parolin as being too similar to Pope Francis, but that perception could be a bit flawed. In fact, he's a veteran diplomat who is known for his administrative ability and reasoned approach, unlike Francis, whose reputation is that he is given to impulsive decisions, which he then reverses without telling anyone. Interestingly, Parolin specializes in geopolitics, and under both Pope Francis and Pope Benedict, he has long been involved in political affairs around the world, and in the Vatican's effort to unite all religions under the authority of the Pope. Needless to say, excelling at geopolitics and having an insider's knowledge of the Vatican drive to unite all religions would be two essential skills for the coming false prophet. Paroline would, in my view, be the steadying force that many of those in the College of Cardinals would be looking for in the next pope. He would not be as unpredictable and divisive as Francis has been, and would be able to offer a sense of continuity going forward while also being an agent of change. Caroline has said that he has an open mind toward Trump. Cardinal Pietro Perolin, the Vatican's number two, thinks it's time to give the new president the benefit of the doubt before making rash judgments against him. I think we should give the president time to make whatever decisions he deems appropriate. Personally, I already like the fact that he presented himself the president of everyone. He would likely look to move the church in a more moderate direction and perhaps even surround himself with those who view Trump favorably, someone like Archbishop Pagano comes to mind. Before I get into something very weird about Paroline's name, let me ask if you ever wondered why a pope would not use their baptismal name, but instead take on an assumed name, recent examples being Pope Francis and Pope Benedict. Well, that wasn't always the case. By some accounts, the naming tradition began with Pope John II, who was named Mercurius at birth after the god Mercury. He changed his name after assuming the papacy in the year 533, believing it would be inappropriate for the head of the Christian church to share the name of a pagan god. There are those now in the church who believe it would be a refreshing change for the next pope to use his baptismal name rather than an assumed name. The next pope could very well use a baptismal name to symbolize that things will be different from now on, especially in the area of sexual abuse allegations. If indeed the next pope is Pietro Paroline, as I suspect, and if Paroline does decide to keep his baptismal name, there is something very weird about that. And before I show it to you, I want you to understand that I'm not saying this is a sign from God or biblical proof of any kind. It's just, well, weird. 
first, let's take a look at what the official name would be of the next pontiff, assuming Paroline is the chosen one. It would be Pope Pietro Paroline. The first thing that jumps out, of course, is that there was never a Pope Peter because of Peter of the Bible. The name Peter is one that other popes have avoided naming themselves. The second thing is that the name Peter reminds a lot of us of the prophecy of the popes by St. Malachi. Of course, the prophecy of the popes is almost certainly a forged document, but it does state that the last pope would be named Peter the Roman. But here's what's really weird about Paroline's name. Look at what happens if we mirror or reflect his name. Does anything jump out at you, such as perhaps three sixes? Again, this could be just a strange coincidence, but it is very odd of all things that his name would reflect three sixes in much the same way as the false prophet will reflect the Antichrist. There are also those on YouTube, such as Brother James Key, who believe that the next pope will be named Pope Sixtus the Six. Although I greatly respect Brother Key, and he could end up being exactly right about this, there is one other slight variation on that idea. What could happen is that we have a pope who uses his baptismal name at first, such as Pope Pietro Paroline, and then, a couple of years down the road, after the Antichrist seats himself in the Third Temple, the Pope could have then officially change his name to Pope Sixtus the Sixth. Time will tell, of course, but we certainly don't have very long to wait, that's for sure. So anyway, these are my thoughts on the coming false prophet. If you care to leave a comment, please do. And as always, please be respectful of one another. Thanks again for watching. Take care.